if you don't already know me, my name's Matt Pierce, and um, I'm joining you on this uh, series of going through Galatians. Um, I don't know if you've been able to listen in the past uh, few weeks, uh, but Seagate are delivering a series of sermons on uh, the, the uh, book of Galatians. Um, and it's brought to you by uh, the Men's Discipleship Group. And we've been meeting together for the past year. Uh, we've been studying Bible doctrine, church leadership, uh, discipleship, and studying Galatians. And we've been able to preach to each other um, each month and then uh, critique each other, give each other feedback for our learning so that we can develop. And uh, really thank Richard for taking us through this course. Um, but one thing he did say to us when this time last year when we were discussing it was that it may lead to some sort of preaching um, in the future. Um, what he didn't say was I'd end up sat in my own dining room, nobody else here, and talking to a camera. Um, but uh, hey, at least uh, you can't heckle me or tell me to stop. But I really pray that uh, it blesses you in some way and it's a, a good way of you getting some uh, uh, teaching on God's word. Um, let me pray. Lord, please guide me as I s say these words, Lord. Please be it your words that I say. Speak through me and guide me. Lord, I ask that people understand your word as you intend. And it's not me, Lord. Lord, to your name be the glory, not to us. Lord, be your name to the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to look at Galatians 2, verses 15 to 21 today. So the benefit of it not being live is you can hit pause if you're struggling to find that in your Bible, and then you can hit play again when you find it. So Galatians 2, verse 15 to 21. You and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. But suppose we seek to be made right with God by, uh, through faith in Christ, and then we are found guilty because we have abandoned the law. Would that mean that Christ has led us to sin? Absolutely not. Rather, I am a sinner if I rebuild the old system of law I already tore down. For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all its requirements so that I might live for God. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. Okay, so um, this passage um, in Galatians, I'll just give you the background of where we are in case you haven't seen the, um, the other parts of this series or just to remind you. Um, so in Galatians, Paul is the author here and he's writing to a group of churches in um, a Roman region of Asia Minor called Galatia. And that's where modern day Ankara is in Turkey. And here, Paul is speaking to Cephas, um, whose name can be translated into Simon Peter, which you'll recognize as one of the 12 apostles. Um, and so far in Galatians, Paul has been defending his apostleship um, and his position to speak to the churches. And in this passage that I've just read, he moves on to defending the gospel. Um, so from this passage, uh, let me discuss three things um, with you. Um, the law, by faith, and how we live. And so three topics, three headings, if you're taking notes, is the law, by faith, and how we live. So let me start off with the law. And if we go to chapter 15 in that passage, it says, You and I are Jews by birth and not sinners like the Gentiles. Paul here is not referring to Gentiles as sinners in relation to moral law, um, like the Ten Commandments, for example, but in, to sinners in ceremonial law, such as circumcision, diet laws, cleansing laws, and various ceremonial duties. And that law we're referring to is from the Torah, which is set out in the early books of the Bible. And obedience to this law was the obligation to meet God's favour and blessing. It occupied a huge place in the life of Israel. If the law was broken, then the relationship with God would be broken. And people did all sorts of sacrifices and penalties to get that relationship back. 
And referring to law was a really Jewish point of view that Paul's trying to discuss here. This law was really important for the Jews. It was their whole basis of getting right with God. And how do we get that relationship with God, even though we're not obedient to that law? Um, so we'll discuss that later as we move on. Peter knows that the Jews and the way they follow the law is of great importance. Um, the Jews are a very powerful group of people. So in his discussions with Paul, they both know that challenging the Jews about the law will be a significant thing. Um, moving on to verse 16, Paul is pointing out that we, will n- that we will not be made right with God by following the law. Paul also says this in Romans 7, um, verse 6. But, we have made, but now we have been released from the law, for we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. For we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the spirit. Um, Many of these laws just became rituals that people just did um, without a focus of why they were doing them. And I had to think about this and I I thought about how we can follow rituals, but it takes us away from um, following the original idea. Um, And I thought about an example of a marathon runner. Don't know why I came up with that idea. But... um, So a marathon runner on the morning of a race, he goes through the same rituals, like putting on the same pair of shorts they've always raced in, eating a certain breakfast, retying the shoelaces, retying them, tying them again to make sure they're absolutely optimum. And they're doing all these rituals, you know, almost habits now. Does this make the race any better? Um, Maybe slightly, maybe not. But what does make the difference is the week in, week out of training, having a healthy lifestyle, and um, not succumbing to poor lifestyle choices. Basically, living that race every day. And this is what gets the good race result. Not missing out on one of those little rituals um, uh, and worrying about every tiny detail and then panicking that you haven't done that ritual. And that is, that's what it's like with the rituals of the law. It takes away the focus of why you're living for the law in the first place. If you live every day focusing on your faith in Christ, considering your faith in all aspects of your life, then you will naturally want to follow what the, law has, what the Lord has commanded. Let me take us to Hebrews 9. Um, before the part that I'm just about to read, Um, chapter 9, there's been a description of how the tabernacle should be built, where certain priests were allowed to go and what sacrifices should be performed. Um, In Hebrews 9, starting at verse 9, this is an illustration pointing to the present time. For the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the consciences of the people who bring them. For that old system deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies physical regulations that were in effect only until a better system could be established. So Christ now became the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered the greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls are the ash, or, and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as perfect sacrifice for our sins. And that is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of sins that they had committed under that first covenant. Hebrews 9 goes on to discuss that when a will is left by someone, we need to establish that that person has died before that will can be put into effect. After Moses had read each of the commandments, he sprinkled the book of God's law and um, the people with the blood of um, a calf and a goat. Um, Moses then said, this confirms the covenant God has made with you. Then whenever they needed forgiveness, they had to re-establish that covenant with blood and sacrifice of animals. But Jesus sacrificed himself and his blood brought us that forgiveness once and for all. Because if that wasn't the case, if we were still in the old covenant system, Jesus would need to die again and again. Um, So I need to move on to my second point now, by faith. 
Okay? Um, in verse 17, Paul supposes to Peter that we seek to be made right with God by faith. This might be a good time to um, ask, what does Paul mean, be made right with God? He refers to it with the law and faith. Um, Paul wrote in Romans, if I refer to Romans 3, verses 23 to 26, for everyone has sinned, we, have, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God this, did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Paul continues in verse 17, uh, maybe in preparation for a counter-argument from the Judaizers. Would that mean that Christ has led us into sin? Certainly not. He's saying we aren't sinning if we follow Jesus by faith and do not obey the ritual laws. Jesus took away our bondage to the law by taking judicial penalty for us on the cross. That doesn't mean to say we have carte blanche to sin and not follow moral law. However, sin's power is broken. We are dead to sin and alive to Christ. If we look in Hebrews 11, there are loads of examples of people showing faith. The fundamental thing about faith is living to something not seen. We all know that analogy that we can't see the wind, but we know it's there because of its effect. And the same is with Jesus. We can no longer see him, but we can see his effect in ours and other people's lives. In Hebrews 11, it talks about lots of examples of people doing things by faith. Um, Noah building the ark. He believed and had faith that he would need it. Um, Sarah had a child. She believed that God would keep his promise. And Isaac was born to Sarah and Abraham. Verse 17 of Hebrews 11 says, It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is a son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. In that story from Hebrews, um, Abraham trusted God and had faith completely. He proved his complete love and faith, and Abraham knew he could trust God with everything. Um, we were first told about Abraham's faith in Genesis 17, and uh, the Hebrew story there referred to it. Um, the Lord changed his name from, from Abraham to Abraham, meaning the father of a multitude, which was a little ironic because him and Sarah couldn't have um, children and they were in the 90s. Uh, but the Lord provided and Abraham's wife, she was called Sarai first, she was now called Sarah. Um, and uh, so Abraham and Sarah had a son, um, which in Hebrews we just refer to Isaac and a multitude of followers of the Lord became their descendants. And Abraham had faith. And the ultimate demonstration of that was in Genesis 22. Um, and um, we may know the story. I'll remind you of it just now. I referred to it in my devotion a few weeks ago. But um, God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, his only son. And this is so confusing to us, really, because repeatedly in the Bible, uh, Deuteronomy 12 is an example, um, God tells us that child sacrifice is wrong. Um, Abraham made Isaac carry the wood for the sacrifice altar as they climbed the hill. Just like many years later, Jesus would carry his own cross. And they set up the altar and Abraham was about to sacrifice his one and only son because he had faith in the Lord. And just when he was about to make that sacrifice, an angel of the Lord stopped him. And if you remember, they provided a, a, a lamb in a bush that he found and that lamb took the sacrifice. Um, just like Jesus is the lamb of the world and took our sacrifice. 
So Abraham is the father of our faith. Um, and the example to live by faith. And so that takes me on to the next part that I was uh, promised to talk about was how we live. Um, verse 18, Paul moves on to guidance about how we can live and how we can apply um, the principles he's talked about into our lives today. He says that he's toned down the idea of living to the law. And I've just described how Jesus is taking that away from us. So now to go back to it would be a sin. Um, in Romans 6, um, verses 1 to 10, Paul is writing again to us. And I'll read that to you. Um, well then, we, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Jesus Christ in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of his Father, now we also live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now he lives. He lives for the glory of God. In this passage, Paul is telling us to be careful and not think that now we have grace, we can just ignore all the Old Testament law and just live how we want. That's not the case. And this is the third point that I'm talking about here. Um, this is how we live. And um, hopefully this will explain with the words that Paul wrote. So going back to um, Galatians, uh, the passage we're reading, in verse 19, uh, Paul refers to himself as living to the requirements of the law um, and now living for God. Um, and I think here he's referring to some, some of the Jews are so wrapped up in following every detail of the ceremonial ritual laws um, that they've forgotten or lost their capacity to focus on God. The original reason that they would have followed the law in the first place, by following God, by faith in Jesus, we have re-established that focus each and every aspect of our lives. Um, and that was what I was referring to when I spoke about the marathon runner. Um, we tie ourselves up in the rituals and actually forget what we, uh, our main focus on is. So we put Jesus into every part of our lives and trust and have faith in him. We stay focused on him rather than doing all these little um, tasks that we think are keeping us right. Um, moving on to verse 20. Now, this has got a huge meaning for me. And uh, uh, I was so pleased when I was given this passage to preach on. Um, I got all the Bibles from the house out and uh, I got my own Bible out and I've just got it here. Um, so I just turned to the passage. Um, and as I read it, I don't know if you can see here, just there, I've actually underlined verse 20 there. And um, I remember doing that shortly after I became a Christian. I underlined that line. It had significance to me. And uh, this is the New King James Version. And um, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Um, and like I say, I studied a, a few different translations of the Bible to get together the study for this passage uh, in order to bring this, uh, this uh, lesson to you. And um, one of the other Bibles I got was um, this one. It's, a, it's quite, you probably can't see on the video, but it's a, a really old TBS Bible and um, it's a bit battered. Um, it's Vanessa's from when she was really young. Anyway, I turned to the same passage and she here has highlighted the same passage uh, in green pen, she's highlighted it. Um, uh, this one says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the faith which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Living out that passage 
along with the symbolic act of my baptism, started a change in my life. I wasn't a nice person before I decided to go to do what that passage says and live by faith in Jesus Christ. In my twenties, I lived you know, life in the fast lane and I didn't care who got upset. I lived for myself. I lived in this world. Um, my mum had faith in me though. She continually forgave my mistakes and she kept faith in me because she loves me. And I ask, if you love Jesus, have faith in him. He didn't make mistakes, but he took our sins away and my sins then. He was perfect and taking away our sins, he just showed ultimate love. And that started a change in my life, and I'm still failing, and I'm still learning. But that passage keeps me on track. And I'd encourage you to read that uh, Galatians 2 verse 20, uh, whenever you need to be reminded to stay in line with Jesus and follow him by faith. And when it gets tough to do it, just pray and ask Jesus to help you. You don't need a big long list of rules and laws. Simply pray and live your life with Christ in you and in all you do. Trust and have faith in Christ. And then you'll so want to follow what the Bible commands us. And I've got an example about how um, living by faith and having Jesus in our lives played so significantly for me. And I was thinking of examples and this one stuck out to me that I needed to tell you about. Really, I wanted something, you know, that would show me how to be really heroic and something I could just tell you and you'd think, oh yes, brilliant. But I'm sorry, the story that I was clearly told to tell you just shows my failings. Um, several years ago, um, in tune, I was walking through the Boots car park um, and I don't think the weather was particularly brilliant and I had lots of bags to carry. I'm weighed down with bags. Um, I'm walking on my oldest daughter, Maddie. She was holding one hand and she had loads of stuff and I've got loads of stuff in that hand and I'm holding her hand. Um, Isla, my uh, youngest child, she could only just walk. So I'm half letting her walk, half carrying her. I'm walking along through the car park and we walk past a lady um, stood next to a car with another, she had a young child. And she had a flat tire on a car. It was only flat at the bottom though. Um, and she said to me, um, what should I do? What, what do I need to do? And um, I thought, there's no way I can help you. I'm in, I'm in daddy daycare calamity. Um, you know, my strife was much worse than hers. So I just said to her, um, don't drive it like that. Um, it'd be dangerous. Just leave it, um, ring somebody to help you and uh, get it fixed before you go anywhere. And then I carried on in my uh, seemingly more important struggle. About 10 metres later, I didn't get very far, but 10 metres later, I cannot tell you exactly how this happened, but it just felt so physical, like a whack on the back of my head or a shout, something so jarringly sudden. And it was like, Matt, what are you doing? And it just came to me and I'm embarrassed to admit that that's what I did. Anyway, I looked at the girls and I goes, that lady needs us, what would Jesus do? So we went back and I told the girls, we're in a busy car park, please behave, please um, be sensible here, just stand there whilst I fix this lady's car. Anyway, fix the car, said goodbye, off we popped. And then I thought, oh, I didn't tell the lady why. And I did pity myself then that, you know, I'd had this experience and I didn't actually tell the lady why I'd gone back. Um, years later, I thought, was it um, a, a witness to the children? But nevertheless, by faith in Jesus, living with Jesus in me all the time, I eventually did the right thing. Wouldn't it be better that I was living with Christ in me and I would have done that straight off without a, a thought? Um, so if we lived by putting Jesus into our hearts and minds in everything we do, it would so move us and have our hearts aligned with Jesus that we would want to obey what the law says and we'd feel terrible when we don't. And don't think for one minute I'm here telling you all this, thinking I'm perfect and I do this all the time. Hopefully I've shown you that I fail and I keep doing so. But going back to Jesus will hopefully mean that we learn and fail less frequently. We have been forgiven for those failings, 
We believe and have faith in Jesus. And Paul carries on in verse 21. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. Now where it says for Christ to die, in some translation, Christ died on the cross for me. It refers to this for, and that's from the Greek word hupa. And hupa can be more verbosely translated as on behalf of. Now that makes it more personal, doesn't it? Christ died on behalf of me. He died on behalf of you and all of us. He took that penalty so we aren't in bondage with the rituals of the law. So that our sin is taken away and our old self dies on the cross with Jesus. Verse 21 says that Christ died in vain if we don't believe this passage. And that is a huge statement. Verse 20 again. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you're a Christian here today, please reflect on that verse and trust Jesus in all the areas of your life. And if you don't yet know Jesus, and this has given you questions that you ask, need to ask or want to know more, please get in touch with us. Um, via our website would be a good place to start. Or just talk to somebody that you know has faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm sure they'd be happy to talk to you. But please do not do nothing. Do something. Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity of study and speaking. Thank you for your guidance, Lord. And I pray that we can do everything to endeavour to live the lives that you want us to do, Lord. I ask that you guide us into trying to live our lives as closely and as connected to Jesus in everything. In Jesus' most mighty name, Lord. Amen. Thank you for listening. And uh, can I leave you, not with my words, but words from God's word. It's Philippians 4, verses 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Thank you very much.